Well, hello, my name is Pastor Brady, and you have found, successfully found, our online streaming right here on our Facebook page. Or maybe you're watching on our website. No matter where you're watching from, we want to thank you for tuning in for today's live worship service from right here at the Caring Place that gathers, grows, and goes all for the glory of God. We hope and pray you enjoy your worship experience today. So let us know in the comment section below if you're on Facebook that you're here. Hit that share button and grab your Bible and get ready to worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, during this worship service today. Thank you, and we're glad you're here. All right. Well, good evening, church. It's so good to see you here tonight as we gather to worship the Lord. I do want to go ahead and let you know we're not live streaming tonight. Uh, we are recording. The service will be put up at a later time. Uh, I don't know if you noticed today, but uh, there was a pole outside that was hit. And uh, I'll just tell you this story and and then we'll begin our worship service. But uh, Alan and I were in the office today just talking, you know, working, whatever. And Velvet comes running down the hall and she's so excited but she can't get the words out. And I said, Velvet, what's going on? I said, I said, Velvet, what, what happened? She, and then she finally says, somebody hit the pole. I said, what pole? And before I could say what pole, Alan's running out the door. And uh, I didn't have my shoes on, so I had to go get my shoes. And then Velvet's like, well, why don't you run after the truck? I said, I'm not running after the truck. You know, we'll, we'll look at the cameras. We'll figure it out. So anyway, poll was hit. Dominion came. Everything's okay. Uh, our phones are out right now. So if you try to call the church, just be patient with us. Uh, we're going to try to get them up and running as soon as we can. But that's one of those things you just... You just can't help. You just can't do anything about it. So uh, anyway, well, we're going to open up with our opening verse of Scripture tonight. And praise team, I'm going to invite you to come and get ready to lead us in worship tonight. But Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We want to make sure we leave this place in that state before we leave tonight. Okay, why don't you stand as we sing our opening hymn. I'll be right back. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Watch 
watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Thank you, you may be seated. Who has a word of praise tonight? Something you're thankful for. Something that that blessed assurance has given you this week. Anybody? Okay, what you got? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Okay. Salvation, salvation. All right, wonderful. Pastor, we will turn that over to you now. We were just giving testimonies. Awesome, thank you. All right, going to go over our prayer guide tonight. I know we had some walk in, just want to, um, not to beat a dead horse, but uh, if you just walked in, do want to let you know, uh, the pole outside was hit today. That was hit by a garbage truck. We've got it all under control. The only uh, casualty we have is our phones are down for a while, and uh, that'll be fixed hopefully in the next few days. So just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, as far as your prayer guide, please continue to pray for John Godfrey. John Godfrey uh, is in the hospital tonight. He had knee replacement surgery this morning, and everything went well. He's good. He should be uh, let go tomorrow and get to go home, so just pray for him. Also, Lucy May Gant, she is still at NHC. If you'd like to go visit her, I encourage you to do that. Um, the, I saw her today, but she was in therapy, and she didn't like therapy, so... Uh, <laughs> which I understand. And, and the whole time she was talking to me, she's still doing her exercise while she's talking to me. I said, well, Lucy May, you can take breaks. She said, that lady said, I can't. <laughs> I said, okay, all right, all right. So just continue to pray for her and visit her if you had the opportunity. Judy Lowry still at Opus. Um, please pray for Bobby Ayers. Bobby Ayers had a stroke yesterday. And uh, he was at uh, Providence Hospital this morning when I saw him. Uh, he's doing okay. He's doing well. His uh, right side, he's having some issues with, but he can speak well. Everything's okay with him. Uh, so he's going to be going to a rehab, uh, the new one where, where you went, Harville. Uh, he's going to be going to that one. And so Lexington, I can't remember the name of it, but he's going to be going to that one. And I encourage you to visit him if you have the opportunity. Uh, he really needs our prayers and visits during this time. Uh, pray for Mary Kirkland. Mary Kirkland was in the hospital uh, overnight earlier this week in the ER, and she has been, uh, she was dismissed that same morning, went and checked on her, and, and she's doing okay, but just continue to pray for her. Uh, be in prayer for the Marion Marks family. There's two needs in that family. His mother, Loreen, uh, is on hospice care, and, and it could be any day that she goes to be home with the Lord, so just continue to pray for uh, the family, and uh, I've talked with Loreen many times, and you know, she told me she was saved, and she told me a lot of times she was ready to see the Lord. And so let's just pray tonight that uh, God will go ahead and take her home if that be his will. And then also Marion's brother, Hugh, uh, had open heart surgery on Monday morning. He's doing well um, under the circumstances, but continue to pray for his brother. Also, we have a, a person that's a friend of our church, uh, Tina Brantley's mother, Betty Crump, continue to lift her up in prayer. Also, Alice Carroll, that is Angela Livingston's mother. Um, she's in the hospital, so continue to pray for her uh, and all these different needs. I kid you not, it's Wednesday, and I've already done 14 visits, so y'all pray for me. I haven't had a whole lot of time to breathe this week, so I'd appreciate your prayers as well. Um, don't forget, baptism, we're going to start our service off on Sunday with baptism. We've got four folks that we're going to baptize, and then also a part of Sunday's service, uh, Margie Rich is going to bring our moment in history and give us a little bit of the history of the WMU, so... We're doing that as a part of our bicentennial year. Uh, ladies, don't forget your Women on Mission meeting is this coming Monday at 6 o'clock. And uh, we need you to bring items for sister care. 
Um, so the items, the list of items are in the Welcome Center. I think Hannah and those have been sending you those online or different things. So make sure you pick up that list and make sure you buy those items so that we can help Sister Care. If you don't know what Sister Care is, it is an organization that helps women who have been abused. And so this is an incredible opportunity, ladies, for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community there in West Columbia. And so uh, don't forget, the last day you can sign up for D Groups is next Wednesday. So keep that in mind. And also, if you are interested in going on the mission trip that Pastor Chris mentioned, uh, Sunday, I think, uh, as of this morning, there were already 17 spots filled. So if you're going to go on that mission trip, you need to sign up as soon as possible. And as I told somebody earlier this week, signing up does not lock you in. That just says that you're interested. Well, you're not technically locked in until you pay the $140. So keep that in mind. If it's too full, we'll do a wait list and, and do it that way, which wouldn't that be awesome? They have a wait list for a mission trip. That'd be, that'd be cool. Continue to play, uh, pray for Melissa Lee. She had her first round of uh, chemo last Thursday. Chris is with us tonight. Continue to pray uh, for Melissa. Don't forget Brotherhood. All these other things are here. Uh, don't forget about our podcast that will release tomorrow. Uh, we've got episode number three of the Menorah podcast. Encourage you to listen to that. Okay, I uh, also continue to pray for Lee and Janice Willits. They are out of quarantine. If you'd like to go and visit them at Lexington Extended Care, I'm sure they would love that. Um, they're not, they don't have COVID anymore. They're okay, and they can now be visited if you'd like to go and do that. Okay, any other prayer requests at this time? Yeah. Okay, you said Bob Bennett. Oh, okay. You're talking about mats. No. You're not talking about mats. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry I got confused, Sandra. So, Pop Bennett and then also Paul Abrams' daughter... Had surgery earlier this week. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Charles? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, for those that didn't hear Charles, please pray for Good News Club. That starts back Tuesday. We got a brand new crop of kids that get to hear the gospel. And then also uh, the people in Lynch, Kentucky, which is where our mission trip will be. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, I do want to share something with you. I'm glad we're not live streaming tonight. Um, many of you know I serve, I try to serve our association and whenever I can to represent you. That's one reason I do it. And uh, earlier this week, I'm on the administrative business team for the association. And so I uh, got to see Miss uh, Beverly yesterday at association. She volunteers there. But uh, we had our first meeting yesterday. And so we don't have a chairman yet, but I have to fill in until we get one. So I'd appreciate your prayers as we work through that and uh, just pray for your leaders, not just in the church, but also in the association. And it's an honor to be able to represent you in that way. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to come and the opportunity to come and to worship, Lord, as we get ready to open up your word. Father, we lift up all these different requests, Father, that we've mentioned, Lord, by name and even those that were not by name tonight. Father, we ask that you would be the great Jehovah God that you are, the healer you are, Jehovah Rapha, and all these situations, Father. And thank you for the people that you've brought here tonight and that are a part of this congregation. We pray the preaching of your word will penetrate our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said. Amen. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Oh, 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 oh. All your way are good, all your ways are sure, I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight, high above my life, I will trust in you alone, in you alone, where you go, I'll go, where you stay, I'll stay. Follow you. When you love, I love. How you 
you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you for that praise team. If you have a copy of God's Word, I'm going to ask you to turn in or turn on to 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're going to continue in our verse-by-verse -verse series through 1 Samuel tonight. And uh, if you were here with us last week, we were in 1 Samuel chapter 2. As we looked at verses 27 through 36 with a sermon entitled Rejecting of the Rebels is what we looked at last week. As we saw that a messenger brings conviction, the messenger bestows consequences, the messenger broadcasts a curse, and the messenger brings change. And so tonight, I want us to continue in our series, and this, hopefully you got one of the handout sheets tonight that will kind of guide you through some of the notes and some of the different things. But I want to talk to you on a sermon I've entitled, The Call of God. Just that simple, the call of God. We're going to look at the entire chapter of chapter 3, 1 Samuel tonight. And I'm going to give you this sermon in a sentence, okay? In this passage, we can see the call of God by looking at a quiet period, a quandary presented, a quivering pronouncement, a question proposed, and a quest presents itself for young Samuel. And so, as long as I live, for me personally, and I know we have another preacher here tonight, Brother Steve is here, and he will agree with me in this, there has never been a day that I will, I will never forget the night that God called me to the ministry. And I believe that Steve would agree with me in that, right? I'll never forget the time that God called me. And if God has ever called you to do something, it doesn't necessarily have to be vocational ministry, but if God has called you to witness to somebody, if God has called you to teach, if God has called you to do whatever you do for the glory of God, according to Corinthians, then you will remember that call. As an 11-year-old boy at Century Kid Camps at Tacoa Falls College in Georgia, God called me to the ministry. I'll never forget that. It was a Thursday night, and I couldn't sleep the entire night because I was so excited for what I felt God was doing. At that time, I didn't know what all it would entail. And to tell you the truth, if I would have known what the ministry entailed at 11, I probably would have said no, right? Uh, but I said yes, and I followed anybody that tells you they want to be in the ministry probably doesn't need to be, right? Because it's not something you want to do. It's something you have to do. Because it's what God has called you to do. And so there are many, many strong things that we find in our world today. But I can promise you there is nothing stronger than the call of God. There is absolutely nothing stronger than the call of God. In our scripture text tonight, we're going to see that God calls Samuel to his first prophetic message that he is delivered. And oh my goodness, is it quite the doozy that Sam, excuse me, Samuel has to deliver this to. Right? I have a friend, his name's Samuel, but we call him Sam. So if I say Sam, just excuse me. But the first act of Samuel as a prophet might be the most difficult one that Samuel ever does. God is going to give Samuel a prophetic word that he has to relay to his boss. Right? His mentor, the high priest at Shiloh that, that Samuel has to give to this person. He was to announce the judgment of the Lord to the most powerful family in Israel at that time. And what we're going to find tonight is that Samuel's message is coming right after an unnamed messenger already gave Eli bad news. Y'all remember that last week when the unnamed messenger came and said, Eli, this is what's going to happen to your sons. And now this little boy that he's been mentoring is going to tell him even more things. Right? So we're going to see that tonight as we look at the call of God. If you have a copy of God's Word, I'm just going to ask you to uh, turn there. And if you're physically able, if you would, please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God as we read 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the Word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. 
The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. What a perfect response. Here I am. Not who are you, but here I am, right? Okay. Anyway, um, verse 5. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. You, you, gotta, you get the sense here in the Hebrew that Eli's a little frustrated. Like, let me sleep, right? Go away kind of thing. Uh, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant here. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood. Now that's very powerful. And the Lord came and stood Okay, that's implying the presence of God was there in the room. Okay, and so calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak your servant for your servant hears. And then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew. Because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning. And probably didn't sleep, right? Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son? And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, Eli meaning, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord reveals him, revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word tonight, that it speaks to us, Lord, and that you can change us through it, Father. We ask, Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins where we failed you. I ask you to hide me behind your cross as I seek to proclaim your word tonight. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. you may be seated. I want to ask you this question this evening, and we're going to have to move pretty quickly because there's a lot of verses to get through. But the question I need to ask you is, what does this passage of Scripture show us that the, call of, that the call of God is strong and it is persistent? I think the number one thing you need to see in this text comes out of verse 1. There is a quiet period. All right, there's a quiet period in Israel. Look at verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. As a Christian, like those of us who are Christians in the room, you and I have the Old Testament and the New Testament. We do not realize what kind of advantage that really is, right? That is something that obviously Samuel did not have. So it's easy for us to be able to take the Word of God for granted. Because nobody in here can say God has not spoken to you because you have His Word. And God speaks to us through His Word. Right? So we, we, we have a hard time understanding, at least I do, when it says, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Because if you want a word from God, open up your word and open up your heart and you'll get a word from God. Right? But Samuel didn't have that option. Right? They, they didn't have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Israel had gotten used to not hearing from God very often. So Samuel was growing up and ministering unto the Lord and he was learning from different people. 
But Samuel wasn't necessarily learning from God up to this point because he hadn't heard from God yet. And think about the examples he had. He had Eli who swept things under the rug. And he had Hophni and Phinehas who we talked about last week. And we won't go into that. But hopefully you remember some of their character traits. And some of the things that we discussed. Now it wasn't necessarily an exciting time to begin his ministry. And I don't really want to compare myself to Samuel. But COVID wasn't an exciting time to start ministry either. Right? But we did it. Right? Right? And God blessed and God did what he does. There's two things you need to see in verse 1. Number one, you need to see the rarity of God's word. The rarity of God's words. And the Lord, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. We need to remember tonight that just because God is sometimes silent does not mean that he's not there. Even if God is silent, he's still present. Because he's almighty God, right? We might not be listening to him because he might not be saying what we want him to say. And that's where we have to open up our ears and and our hearts to what he has to say. Because God is always present whether we choose to listen or not. If you look at the word rare in the Hebrew, it literally means... Oh, I was about to sneeze. If you look at the word for rare in the Hebrew, it literally means precious. Precious. Right? Literally means precious. During this time in Israel's history, prophetic visions were not the normality. It wasn't something that happened a lot. Sometimes if you're doing the Old Testament reading plan, you can read through the Old Testament and say, man, well, God speaks a lot. He speaks here. He speaks here. But if you look at the Old Testament from a micro perspective instead of a macro, you're going to see that God doesn't speak all that often. He does when we look at it from our viewpoint, but from their viewpoint, you might have four generations and God hasn't spoken. And yet, we take advantage of having God's word that he has spoken, and we don't dig into it. I mean, we might get to heaven and maybe some of the Old Testament saints will say, man, y'all had it good and y'all didn't even realize it. Right? I mean, y'all didn't have to live by the laws. You had the word of God. And so, uh, Stephen J. Andrews pointed out a really good point. Great commentator. He said, between Joshua and Samuel, there were only three prophets mentioned and five revelations given. Now, you've got these in your notes. The three prophets that had spoken between Joshua and Samuel. Uh, the three prophets are found in Judges 4.4, 4, Judges 6.8, and 1 Samuel 2.27-36. And then the five, that's what we talked about last week, the five visions that God gave were found in Judges 2, 1 through 3, Judges 6, 11 through 23, Judges 7, 2 through 11, Judges 10, 11 through 14, and Judges 13, 3 through 21. God wasn't speaking as much since the days of Joshua. So this can cause us to ask the question, why was God silent? Why was God not speaking as much? That's why I want you to see the second thing tonight. I want you to see the reason for God's quietness. I want you to see why I believe in this time that God was quiet, uh, relatively speaking. There was no frequent vision. Frequent vision. You see that in verse 1. So the people had been rebelling against the Lord, right? Israel had been rebelling. You can read the book of Judges and you can see that. And so you see the principle here that God does want us to obey him. It's not a suggestion in his word that God says, man, I hope you do these things. No, it's an imperative, right? You should be doing those things. If you know the Lord, you're going to obey the Lord, right? That's what you should be doing. And most recently in in 1 Samuel 2, 11 through 36, do we not see that the sons of Eli had disobeyed God? And so God is silent because the spiritual leaders are disobeying. Right? And I think that is so important. And so, if you look at Judges 2.14, that verse of Scripture shows us that Israel rebelled against God in those days, and God handed them over to their enemies because they disobeyed God. I'll read it for you. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. So God literally gave them straight to their enemies because they weren't obeying the Lord. God is good, but y'all, he cannot tolerate disobedience. God is good and God is great, but he cannot tolerate disobedience. The fact that God was not speaking to them regularly could have been to show his judgment on them. 
Psalm 66, 18 shows that as, as if that you and I keep sin in our lives, God cannot hear us. So that's important before we pray that we ask God to forgive us of our sin. That's really important. God cannot hear you if you're harboring sin in your heart. Let me read Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So there's a quiet period here. The second thing you need to see in the text tonight is there is a quandary presented. A quandary is presented. Now the word quandary is defined as a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. So when I think of what Samuel is faced with, that is quite the quandary. Okay, that is quite the situation of uncertainty. Why? Because Samuel asked three times. He goes to Eli three times and says, Did you not call me? I'm here. I'm here. Did you not call me? And he doesn't realize why. Because he doesn't yet know the Lord. Verse 7 reveals that Samuel didn't know the Lord. That's why he mistaken God for Eli. But once you know the voice of the Lord, guess what? You can never mistake it. Once you know him and you know his voice and, and you know him personally. Two things we need to pull out of these verses when we look at this quandary that's presented to us. Number one, we need to see that it was business as usual. If you look at verses two through three, you're going to see that it was a usual night of what Shiloh would have been like. It was a regular, normal evening. Eli, the text says that he was sleeping in, quote, unquote, his own place. While Samuel was the, listen to this, Samuel was the closest of all Israelites to the presence of God. Because Samuel was sleeping where they kept the Ark of the Covenant. Now come next week when we talk more about the Ark of the Covenant, please. Okay? We're going to talk about next week how the Philistines came in and they, they captured it because they beat the Israelites because the Israelites were not smart and they shouted, right? And the Philistines heard them. It's crazy. Next week is crazy. So make sure you come for that. So in verse 2, we see yet again the writer of 1 Samuel shows clear evidence that the high priest was aging, Right? Notice that the writer of Samuel is not, does not mince his words in regards to Eli's age. He, he constantly mentions uh, evidence of details that he is older. Stephen J. Andrews said the reference to Eli's eyes is intended to cause us to pause and wonder about his spiritual sight. Does Eli still have his spiritual sight? I thought about that. We know that this is still nighttime due to the fact that the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Now, if you look at Exodus 27, verses 20 through 21, Leviticus 24, 1 through 4, the lamp would burn from evening to morning in the tabernacle, right? And so that's how we know it's still night. Now, let me pause and say, anybody that's doing the same reading plan I'm doing, the Old Testament reading plan, y'all, we got to hang in there. We got to help each other. I know we're in Leviticus right now, but we got to hang in there, okay? Now, the rest of your plans, I'm not sure where y'all are at. But for the blue plan, hang in there, okay? All right, anyway, just wanted to say that. Uh, John Woodhouse said this, On the other hand, in the darkness represented by God's silence and Eli's blindness, the news that God's lamp had not yet gone out suggests that God had not yet abandoned his people. There was still hope. God hadn't abandoned them yet. They had abandoned God. Don't you see that God never abandons us? But we do abandon him, right? Like we abandon him by the way we live our lives. If we decide to do our own thing, that's us abandoning God. God will never leave you and God will never forsake you. So do not ever say that God has left you because God has never left me and I've never known a true believer of Christ that God has actually left. But we leave him. Are you leaving God out of your life tonight? Are you leaving him out? You might not even realize that you are. Now, there's a quite interesting symbolism that you find in verses 2 through 3. The main thing is that it was a normal night, but it wouldn't remain normal for long. I think verse 3 describes Samuel was doing the right things that God had called him to do. Samuel was doing the right things before God called him, if that makes sense. And I believe when God calls somebody, that it's because... He sees something in them that they don't see in themselves. Because I could absolutely promise you as a little kid, I never thought I'd be a pastor. I just didn't. Right? I had seen what the ministry had done to my family members. I'm like, I don't want no part of that. I'll go do ministry somewhere else. Some other kind of ministry. And so that's what God does. If you look there in verse 3, this was an example that he was fulfilling the obligations to tend to the lamp. 
If you look in the Torah, according to Leviticus 24.3 and Numbers 18.23, he was doing what he was supposed to do by tending to that lamp and making sure it stayed on. So it's business as usual, but it's also bewilderment unrecognized. Look there at verses 4 through 7. The Hebrew form of Samuel's response here in these verses closely. This is so awesome. When, when Samuel responds to Eli, or, and when he responds, he, he doesn't realize he's responding to God, but he is. He just doesn't know it yet. His response parallels Abraham, Jacob, and Moses when God called them. You say, how do you know that? Genesis 22, 1, Genesis 22, 11, Genesis 31, 11, and Exodus 3, 4 all show their responses. And Samuel's is similar in the sense that he responded by saying, here I am. He didn't know the Lord at this time. He thought it was Eli, but he was still saying, here I am. And we've got people in the house of God tonight that God's been calling you for years and years and years, and you still won't say, here I am. You'll pull a Moses and you'll say, but this. You'll say, but that. I know for a fact God is calling some of you to go to Lynch, Kentucky. You've never been to Lynch, Kentucky. Like me. I tell you what, I didn't want to go to Lynch, Kentucky. Want me to be honest? And Chris said, told me over lunch, he said, well, what good reason do you have to not go to Lynch, Kentucky? I said, well. He said, we got deacons that can fill in um, Wednesday. I said, yeah. I said, well, what if somebody passes? He said, don't go on what ifs. I said, well, that's true. He said, they can wait. I said, yeah. So I'm going, right? So why are you not going, right? And if it's not there, why not serve in a good news club, right? That's our own mission field right here, right now. Why not do those different things? What excuses do you have instead of saying, here I am? Maybe God's been calling you to teach a little Sunday school class of little children, and you've been saying, no, 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 for years and years. It's time for you to put your hands up and say, here I am, God, use me. Here I am, Lord. I'm ready for you to use me. What I love about these verses is that it shows that God's call is persistent. Even if you say no, God's going to keep calling. Now, here's the thing. There does come a day where God stops. If you quit listening. And so, I've never heard, personally, I've never heard God speak to me in an audible voice. But I know that he's led me and spoken to me in other ways. Right? Through his word and through different things that he uses. And, and, and I want you to see that, the, that the, this call that God was giving Samuel was personal, it was purposeful, and it was private. Here's the thing. I, tell, I say this all the time, and, and we did this during the ordination process. It's not my call to judge your call. If God's called you, he's called you. As long, let me say, preface it with this, as long as your calling aligns with God's word. God can't call you to do something that contradicts his word. Okay? Like, that's just not possible, right? That's just a, a fallacy or confusion of the devil that you've come up with. Verse 7 revealed to us, Now Samuel did not know the Lord. Now that's kind of a, or yet know the Lord. Now that's kind of one of those wait up, hold a minute kind of moments, right? Where you read it and you're like, wait, huh? How, how is God calling him and he doesn't know him yet? In the previous verses, we were not told that Samuel... Uh, was, was ministering to the Lord, growing with the Lord, and enjoyed God's favor. Were we not told those things? We were told that Samuel was ministering, we were told that he was growing, and we were told that he enjoyed God's favor. All of that's already been stated. So what's going on here? If you look at this text in the, in the Hebrew language, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, where it was said that Hophni and Phinehas did not know the Lord is the same wording used except for one important detail. Yet. With Hophni and Phinehas, it says they did not know the Lord. But in the Hebrew, there's this little article, there's this little word that means yet. And that makes the difference in Samuel's case. Because Hophni and Phinehas had closed their hearts to God. But Samuel was open. Now, we don't know if God tried to call Hophni and Phinehas, but even if he did, they said no. By their lives and their actions... In verse Samuel 3, 7, it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And Hophni and Phinehas didn't know him because they rejected him. So while Samuel had been working for God, he wasn't yet living for God. There's a big difference. Don't spend all your years in church working for God and not living for God. Huge difference. 
Because Samuel was working for God, but he didn't know God. I, I don't want you to work for God. I want you to live for God because you know him. You have a relationship with him. And he pours into you and you want to serve him with everything you've got. Not because somebody comes up and says, hey, I want you to do this. No, you pray about it. You see if God's leading you to do that. Let God live through you. So the third thing we see tonight is a quivering pronouncement. If you look at verses 8 through 14 there, this is where God speaks in this situation. In these verses, we see that God is going to give Samuel his first mission as a prophet. I'm sure that this mission, let's just be honest, wouldn't these words that God is telling Samuel to say to Eli, wouldn't that make anybody quiver? If you had to give this quivering pronouncement, I mean, you know, for lack of a better term, shaking in your boots, so to speak, right? Like, I've got to say, what? It's like when I was growing up with my siblings, you know, I was, I've told y'all before, I was the instigator, right? I created the problems. And, and, you know, it's like when you'd go up to one of your siblings and say, well, you tell mom. No, you tell mom. No, you tell mom, right? If you broke something or whatever the case is and you quiver and you get scared, times that by 10, 15, 20, right? This is a big deal. Let me show you four things here. Number one in verse 8, I want to show you Eli's realization. And when the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose, and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. After three times, Eli finally catches on. He's not yet spiritually blind, but he's getting pretty close. Hey, here's the thing. Guys, don't let God have to call you three times for you to perceive what's going on. Don't don't allow that to happen until you realize, hey, I need to get my act together. Due to various reasons, it had been a long time at Shiloh since something like this had happened. But he wasn't yet completely blind. He does realize it. Number two, I want you to see Eli's recommendation. Look at verse 9. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. After Eli realizes what's going on, he gives Samuel's, Samuel instructions, good instructions, for what he's going to need if the Lord were to call him again. So Eli simply tells the young man to tell God to speak. The third thing you see here is that Samuel responds. Look at verse 10. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Verse 10 is truly one of the most incredible verses of Scripture that you find in the Old Testament. There's no way you can read verse 10 and not be utterly appalled. And God stood. Right? Like God was standing there. I mean, even only Moses saw the backside of the glory of God and his face was shining. Right? Like, I mean, he comes down from the mountain and everybody's like, well, what's wrong with you? And he's like, well, what's wrong with y'all? Right? They had a lot of issues at that time. The fourth time that God calls Samuel is different from the first three. There are two main differences. Number one, the Lord came and stood. We are not told that the Lord came and stood the first three times. We're just told that the Lord spoke. This was not a dream. This was not a figment of Samuel's imagination. This is not something that atheists and agnostics can point at and say, well, Samuel was dreaming this and somebody wrote it down and it became gospel. No, God came and stood there, cemented this in the history of of the Bible. And so since we're not given any more details of what's in this text, we don't need to speculate on the manner of God's presence. We just need to know that God was there. We don't need to assume it was his front side, his back side. We, I, we don't know. We just know God stood there. And that's the important thing that his presence was there. The second thing is that God said, Samuel, Samuel. Previously, God had only said Samuel's name one time. Each time he would say it once. But this time he says it twice. And the fact that God repeated Samuel's name is similar to the call of Abraham at Mount Moriah in Genesis 22, 1 and Genesis 22, 11. I think you got to see that parallel. God's trying to get his attention. The fourth thing we need to see on this quivering pronouncement is that God reveals. If you look at verses 11 through 14, you can see what God revealed to Samuel, the message that he was to speak. If there's anybody on the sound of my voice, a man that God has called to preach, if God gives you a message, you have to speak it. It will scare you. It will make you quiver. It will make you croak, whatever. It's tough sometimes. Okay, let me tell you how tough it is. Getting up here and talking about some of these things that we've talked about before, it's tough. 
You think I like coming up here. A few weeks we'll talk about church discipline. Oh boy. Right? Uh, talk about marriage. That's hard. Right? Talk about ministry. All these different things. But what the Lord says to Samuel is a confirmation of the judgment that was given against the house of Eli from the first messenger. Meaning that unnamed messenger was not a joke or a hoax or anything. That this, there, there's legitimacy to this, Eli. You need to realize that, hey, God is trying to get through to him. The language here is strong enough to make anybody quiver and shake. Just imagine the young man receiving this message concerning his mentor and his immediate boss. Obviously, God was his boss, but he was to report to Eli. And he's supposed to say this to him. Robert D. Bergen said, Furthermore, the magnitude and form of God's judgment would be so shocking that it would cause the ears of everyone who hears it to tingle. That is, to give rise to great fear and dismay. God was going to destroy the line of Eli. And there was no offering or sacrifice that could redo that. No atonement for that. How blessed are you and I that 1 John 1, 1 John 1 9 says, we, that get, well, He's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Because Jesus was the ultimate atonement for our sin. But Eli wasn't in that state because they were still under the old covenant law. It's simple, yet it's terrible. God is going to do what he said he's going to do. So it was a quivering pronouncement. The fourth thing is a question is proposed. Look at verses 15 through 18. This is where Eli comes up and pretty much says, hey boy, what did he say? Hey, buddy, what did he say? Now, here's the thing. Obviously, Eli was involved in this the night before because Samuel kept coming to him and saying, Hey, did you call me? He says, No. Hey, did you call me? Hey, did you call me? did it three times. So, obviously, Eli knows something's going on. So, Eli wants to know what's up. I want to show you three things here. Look at verse 15. I want you to see the fright. Samuel experienced some fright, right? Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision of Eli. There is nothing wrong with a preacher or you if you're sharing the gospel with somebody. There's nothing wrong with you being afraid. The only thing that's wrong about it is if you don't speak. You can be afraid. I'm afraid every time I preach. Hopefully you don't know it, but I am. Because I'm delivering God's word. And I'm held accountable to him. Whether you like the message or not, that doesn't matter. I'm held accountable to him. And if you find a man of God that's, that is not afraid to preach, Steve, I don't know if he needs to be preaching. Because if you're not afraid, then there's an issue there, right? And if you're sharing the gospel with somebody, and we had that message Sunday, you should be afraid in sharing the gospel. Right? Not in a bad way, but a healthy fear. Like, I'm delivering God's word here. Not your word, but his. One thing that those who don't stand behind the pulpit may not understand is the burden of being a messenger for the Lord. And I think you see that with Samuel here. He's burdened. He's frightened. He is, he is burdened for the fact that God has given him a message to speak. God has given him something to say. And so sometimes, some of y'all will come up to me and say, Hey, are you okay? You seem stressed. You seem upset. Yes, all those. Because I've got a message from God to speak. And sometimes I have to deal with things like poles falling on the road that have nothing to do with the message. And not just poles. Poles are nice things compared to some other stuff. Right? Right? And so when I look like that, pray for me, but also come alongside and help me or other men of God who are trying to do the work of God. We're supposed to be doing this thing together. If you don't want your pastor to be stressed and burdened, help him out. Right? Come alongside. Because it is a burden carrying God's word and spouses too. Okay, said enough about that. The night that God called me when I was 11, I didn't sleep well. And I assume Samuel didn't either, right? It's, not, it's also not revealed that Samuel knew what was going on at Shiloh. We don't know whether Samuel knew the corruption that was going on or not. So all of this is brand new to him. And I know that I would be afraid just like he was. So you see the fright in verse 15. The other thing you see in verses 16 through 17 is the force. Look at verse 16. But Eli called Samuel... And said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. Uh, here am I. I am or whatever. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Tell me what he said. Now, I've got to kind of think here that Eli might be realized something's going on here. I, I kind of get the sense that, that Eli wants to know so bad because Eli has a guilty conscience. 
He's let things go bad for so long. He just had this unnamed guy show up at his house and tell him that his kids were going to die and all these bad things were happening. And now God is speaking to the young boy, but God won't speak to him as the high priest. Get off your high horse, Eli. You're not the end all be all. God speaks when he wants to speak. And he chose to speak to Samuel, right? Flash forward to what Paul said to Timothy, let no one look down on your youth, what? But set an example for the believers in faith, love, and purity. That's one thing this church does amazingly. You let your young people get in and serve. Without realizing that it's possible, Eli teaches Samuel a great lesson about being a prophet. Eli teaches him that a prophet has to say what God has told him. Now, Eli might be pushing his own agenda here to get out what Samuel has, but Eli's teaching him that he has to speak whether it's uncomfortable or not. And Samuel's going to use that for the rest of his ministry. He's going to have to say a lot of uncomfortable things. He's going to have to tell a mob of two million people that want a king that this isn't best for you. He's going to have to tell them some things that they don't want to hear. Whether it's good news or bad news, if God tells his messenger something, that messenger has to proclaim it. It has to come out. If it doesn't, that's disobedience on the part of the messenger. So this is a lesson that Samuel learned that would benefit him. Not only do you see the fright, the force, I want you to see in verse 18, the fate. And this is the fate that is becoming of Eli. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. I'm sure that Samuel's like, oh no, is he going to draw back? Is, he, is Eli going to hit me? Or, or what's going to happen here? Eli says, this, hey, it's out of my hands. God's in control of this. And I think we need to remember that too. Let God be God. Let God do what he's going to do. He's going to do it whether you like it or not. Because he's God. So many, if not most humans in their flesh, would expect Eli to get mad at God here, would expect Eli to lash out or things of that nature, maybe even verbally. But Eli's response teaches Samuel and can teach us that we are dealing with a holy and sovereign God. And when we mess up, We take responsibility for our actions. When God convicts you, you obviously repent. But if you have wronged someone else, you need to go to them and say, I'm sorry. I've had people come up to me before and apologize, and I'm like, what in the world? I'm like, why are you apologizing? I didn't think anything about that. And they're like, God convicted me, so I had to come to you. That's the power of the Spirit. It doesn't matter how I respond. They were obeying what God told them to do. And that's how we need to respond. Eli's response teaches Samuel that lesson. And it also, what's interesting here, at this point I'm sure that Samuel had put two, or that Eli had put two and two together from the mystery messenger. And now God's speaking that, hey, this little boy is going to be my successor. I want you to think about that. The young people that we have in our church that we're so thankful that we have, uh, they're going to be your successors one day in the church. They're going to be filling the roles that you have right now. So how are you preparing them to take that on? That's something to think about. So Eli accepts his fate as he accepts what the Lord said to Samuel. Whether you like it or not, truth is truth. Truth is truth. The fifth and final thing tonight, we've seen a quiet period, we've seen a quandary presented, we've seen a quivering pronouncement, we've seen a question proposed. But the last thing we see tonight is that a quest presents itself. Samuel has a quest to follow God's plan for his life as a leader in Israel. Verses 19 through 21 show us this. This quest would be to be God's spokesman for the nation of Israel. And as these verses reveal, Samuel was God's man. I believe that when God calls a man to pastor a church, that that's God's man for that appointed time. And to disobey that man or whatever is to disobey God's decision. We might not like it sometimes, but if God has decided that that person is to lead and to pastor, then that person is to do that. And God, was, who was once silent, was speaking through his messenger. Now, look, I want you to look at verse 20. That word established in verse 20 comes from the Hebrew word aman. And it literally means trustworthy and reliability. Israel knew that Samuel was God's man. 
And they were able to go forward because not only did they know he was God's man, they were going to follow him as God's man. And I'm thankful that this church does that. You follow me, you support me, you trust me. I love that. But a lot of churches don't have that. And they don't go anywhere. What I mean by that is they stay the same at the same equilibrium. We don't need to stay that way, right? We need to jump into God's vision, follow the leadership of the church, and keep on keeping on. But Samuel was going to restore much of this because of what God was going to do through him. God has presented a quest for each one of us. You say, God's never given me a quest. Yes, he has. Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Go therefore to all nations, including Lynch, Kentucky, including Gaston, South Carolina, including any opportunities that God's open for us. Go therefore to all nations doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity of the God. We're to follow him in that. We have have a quest. Tell somebody about Jesus. And if you haven't, you're disobeying God. That's what the call of God does. We've all been given a call. Have you followed it? Hopefully you wrote a name down Sunday morning. Have you shared yet? If you haven't, that's okay. You got a week ish. But you should be praying for that person every single day. You say, you get way too excited about that I, I could get a lot more excited because I love what God has called me to do. And I hope you do too. Robert D. Bergen points out, for the first time since Moses, Israel had a national prophet. That's awesome. That Israel finally respected the man of God. The call of God is strong. It's something that should never be underestimated. The most important thing you need to make sure of tonight is have you responded to God's call from darkness to light? If you're not saved, you, you don't know what the call of God is. But if God has called you and burdened you through His power of the Holy Spirit, if you're not saved, come grab my hand. And we can talk about that. But if you are saved, here's my question for you. Have you responded to the call that God has for your life? Now that might look, look different for different people, but the same outcome is the same to make disciples. Are you doing that in what God has called you to do? Are you making disciples who make disciples? When was the last time you led somebody to Christ? I've had four conversations this week with people who have shared with somebody about Jesus in the workplace. That's a beautiful thing. That's only four. If four people can do that, couldn't we have 40 we could do so much more for the kingdom. I want you to see tonight as we close the call of God. I want you to see the quiet period, the quandary presented, a quivering pronouncement, a question proposed, and a quest does present itself. Father God, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity tonight to dig into your word, Father, and to look and see how you called the young Samuel, Father. Lord, I do want to ask, Lord, that if there's anybody on the sound of my voice who hasn't responded to the call of salvation, Father, that they would do that tonight. But Lord, if, if they have responded to you in salvation, and God, what are you calling them to do? How are you calling them to share? How are you calling them to serve? How are you calling them to support? what you're doing, Father. I pray that you convict and probe hearts during this time. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say. This is Pastor Brady, and thank you for tuning in to today's live worship service here from First Baptist Church of Gaston. Maybe today you feel the Lord tugging on your heart after that message and after our worship service. If you would, please email or call the number below or email the email address and you can contact us if you made a decision. Maybe you want to talk with me about accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you want to talk to somebody about rededicating your life. Or just maybe you want more information about The Caring Place. You want more information about our church and the different ministries that we offer. Whatever the case may be, I want to invite you to respond. I want to thank you for watching, whether it's on Facebook, maybe it's on YouTube, or even our website. No matter where you're watching, we thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you next time. And don't forget, we love you here at The Caring Place. It gathers, grows, and goes all for the glory of God.